I want to share a thought with you. And since we're talking about being prophetic, about the outer darkness, the outer darkness, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received one, the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made ta five talents more. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had two talents came forward saying, master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, master, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you find, where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked, slothful, or lazy, you lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. At my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be given more. And he will have abundance but from the one who has not even what he has will be taken away and cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth the outer darkness and then one more scripture. Matthew chapter 27, one verse. And verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. A lot of conversation and chatter today about this thing called success. What is it? What constitutes success? How can I be a successful person? Well, I think in order to understand success, I think a good starting point is to get a good handle, a, get a good, good handle on 
what is success? How can we define success? Let me define for you very clearly to the best of my ability what success is. Success is not being the best. No, it's not being the best. Instead, this is what success is. Not being the best, but success is being your best. And there's a difference between being the best and being your best. Because if you're trying to be the best, then you'll be disappointed. There's always someone better than you, prettier than you, more intelligent than you. But while you may not be able to be the best, you can be your best. Or you can maximize the person that God made you to be so that you don't go to your grave with your best music still in you. And I think this is what this story is about. It's about what it takes for us to be our best. A, worth, a wealthy landowner, wealthy, with a substantial amount of money, great wealth, decides to take an excursion somewhere, and in his absence, he calls in three of his slaves. It says servant, but the Greek word is doulos, which is the word for slave. And to each one of these slaves, he distributes his money in hopes that they will be good stewards and good managers of his money, that they will maximize what he has given to them. To one, he has given 10 talents. Now, when we think of talents, we think of a, an ability, like this brother who, could, who was, has abilities. But talents is the Greek word talaton, which is a unit of money, coinage. And it is a substantial, I mean a substantial amount of money. That's why we know this man is rich. And to one man, he, one of his slaves, he gives 10 talatons. And then to another, he gives two talatons. And then to another, he gives one talaton. And the slave who was given 10 talatons becomes industrious and says, I'm going to maximize my master's money. He works hard for his master to increase his master's wealth. And this, the man who was given two talatons works hard, good steward, and he increases his master's wealth. But the one who had been given just one talaton takes his master's money and buries it in the ground, which was common in those days. You remember the story that Jesus told of a man who was plowing and all of a sudden the plow hits something metallic in the ground and he digs it up and it's hidden treasure and he covers it up very quickly and, sp and spends everything he has so that he might buy the field because people hid their money in the ground and he hid his master's money in the ground. Well, not long after this, the master returns and he asked his slaves to come to give an account of what they did with his money. And the man who had been given 10 talatons said, Master, I have worked and here, master, I've doubled your talaton. Here's 20. And the master said, well done, my good and faithful slave. 
You've been faithful over a few. I will make you ruler over much. Come and enter, watch this, enter into my joy. Or come to my banquet of celebration. And to the man who had been given two talatons, he said, Master, you gave me two, here's four. And he said, well done, thy good and faithful slave. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you rule over much. Come, enter, enter your master's joy. But the one who had been given one talenton said, Master, here's your one. The master said, what? He said, well, Master, I was afraid because I knew you were a hard man and you gather where you didn't sow, you reap where you don't plant. And the master says, well, you, you knew that I gather where I don't sow and you knew that I reap where I don't plant. At least you should have taken my money to the bank where I could have got an interest on my money. So take his one and give it to the man who has 10 because he who has much will be given more and he who has little it will be taken from him and then cast him into the outer darkness now the question is why did Jesus single out the one talent man as the failure it's a story. Is he suggesting that 10 talent people don't fail and two talent people don't fail? Why did he single out the one talent man as the failure in the story? I think he singled out the one talent failure in the, in, failure in the story as the failure because most of the world's inhabitants are not 10 talent people. Most of us are not two talent. Most of us are not even one talent. We are half a talent. <laughs> In other words, most of us were just ordinary. Just ordinary people. Just ordinary. Some of you will never be able to sing on a platform like this because you're just ordinary. You get up every morning in an ordinary house. You wake up in an ordinary bed. Go to an ordinary kitchen. Cook yourself an ordinary meal. Get into your ordinary car. Drive down an ordinary street. Go to an ordinary job where you get an ordinary paycheck. <laughs> and then after an ordinary day, you get back into your ordinary car. You drive back down that ordinary street. You go back into the ordinary house. And then your family asks you, well, how was your day? And you say, ordinary. <laughs> because most of us, we're just ordinary. And let me tell you the temptation of ordinary people. The great temptation of ordinary people is to feel slighted, to feel intimidated in the presence of people who are more gifted than we are, to bow our heads, to think that the world or God, a life has been unfair to us and not even try to look over our fence, the fence at our neighbor's crops 
and lean on our hole while watching our neighbor's crops grow. And that's the temptation of ordinary people. So Jesus singles out the ordinary person because he wants to give us a prescription of what it takes to be successful if you're ordinary. And I think that if you're an ordinary person, if you're the one Talaton person or the half a Talaton person, then please consider this. Success happens through imagination. I cannot emphasize the great church leaders do not always have to have the greatest IQ. They just have to have imagination. When, when, when Disney was a kid, and he was drawing flowers that talk. His art teacher said, flowers don't talk. And Disney says, mine do. <laughs> In other words, he had imagination. And sometimes that's what it takes. Imagination is these mental images, mental visualization that is in our mind. And everything that you see in the physical emanates from something in the imagination of someone. These chandeliers in here, this building, before it was constructed in the physical, it first was conceived in the imagination of an architect because you have to see it before you see it or you won't see it. It's called imagination. And sometimes that's what makes a great church. Just some, some imagination. You know, a, a poet put it this way. Listen to this poem. A poem said, a tree, a road, a hillside, and a white cloud drifts by. Ten men passed along, and all but one passed by. He saw the road, the tree, and the cloud with the artist's mind and eye, and then put it down on canvas for the other nine to buy. All of them saw the cloud, the road, the hillside. But the poet said he saw the road, the tree, and the cloud with the artist's mind and eye and put it down on canvas for the other nine to buy. And the fact of the matter is all nine of them could have painted it, conceived it, but they lacked imagination. I once heard about a medical doctor leaving a psychiatric ward and the residents were behind a fence. He's going up a hill and pss, flat tire. He takes the lugs off his tire and puts them down, pulls the tire out of the trunk, but as he's doing it, all four lugs roll down the hill into a drain and here he is. Doesn't know what to do out in the, in the boonies. And he's out there and the residents are just looking at him. And he's out there not knowing what to do for an hour until one of the residents said to him with imagination, why don't you take one of the lugs from the other three tires and put it on the one tire until you can go and get some more lugs? And he said, well, that's a good idea. And he tried it and he worked. 
and he looked at them and said, that was a good idea, and what are you doing in there? And I'm out here. And they said, we may be crazy, but we're not stupid. <laughs> what did they have that the doctor didn't have with all of his training? Imagination. And to be successful, those of you who only have one gift, sometimes if you just take that one gift and blow into it some Holy Ghost imagination, you'd be surprised what can happen. Thinking outside the box. And beyond the box, I, Bishop told you I'm in a poor, 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 poor neighborhood. And I've been there now in my 40th year. I don't look like what I've been through. It's called Just for Men. <laughs> Imagination. <laughs> And there are many people who would say to me, you know, you need to leave. You need to leave this community. And when I first started back in the late 70s, you need to leave. You need to leave. It's prostitutes here. It's poverty here. It's unemployment here. 46% unemployment in my community. Boarded up houses everywhere. And the very reason they said I needed to leave were the very reasons that we needed to stay. Because there were prostitutes there and because there was crime there. That's the reason we needed to stay. And stay we did. We planted our mailbox in concrete. And systematically used some imagination and said, you know what? This is the place to be because the land is cheap. Nobody wants to buy. No one wants it, which is all gentrification is, by the way. Someone allowing prices and land prices to devaluate so speculators can come in and buy the land. So we started buying all the land around us. That's how we're able to do it. I hope you can come to Louisville sometime and see it. We bought everything, every liquor store. There was nothing but liquor stores and nightclubs. We purchased every liquor club, liquor store, every nightclub, Elizabethan, Baby Grand, California liquors. We purchased them all and use some imagination. God gave us all that land because we stayed with imagination. God gave us the land of the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Shalites, and the Bud Lights. And all we had was just one Talaton. But a Talaton with imagination. What about you, brother, sister, pastor? Maybe instead of complaining, maybe God wants you to say, no, God, show me. Help me to dream. Help me to imagine what this can be. Help me to think outside the box. Help me to use some creativity, some kumba, some creativity. Because it takes imagination. Here's something else to be successful. Motivation. Motivation. And when it comes to motivation, that means what drives you. And in this story, you're either motivated by faith or you're motivated by fear, you're motivated by confidence or you're motivated by cowardness because the, the man said to the master, the slave said to his master, he said, I was afraid, I was afraid. And there's nothing wrong with fear. We're not Hindus who deny emotions. Fear is a God-planted emotion. It's what keeps us alive. It was the fear of war that gave birth to the United Nations. It's the fear of police abuse that has made people use their cameras to watch interactions with the police. But sometimes fear can overshoot its target. It can go too far. 
It's just like the, the man who had terrible bow-leggedness. And he went to a preacher, and the preacher said, I want you to pray tonight five times. Bow legs go straight. Bow legs go straight. Pray it five times. And he said, well, five times will do it. I'm going to pray it ten times. And he prayed it ten times and woke up not need. You, you, you see, you see, sometimes... Sometimes we can overshoot the target. And when it comes to fear, something that should be healthy becomes, well, I'm afraid to take a risk. And sometimes if you're motivated by fear, you can't be successful. You have to be motivated by faith. You got to be willing to take a risk. One of my favorite essayists, was that Australian essayist, Frank Borham. You're looking for good sermon examples, please read Frank Borham. Frank Borham tells the story of, of some birds who were out on the tree limbs, chirping one morning, looking down in a garden. And Dr. Borham said, I talked to those birds and said, good morning, birds. And the bird said, good morning, Dr. Borham. And he said, well, birds, have you had your breakfast this morning? And the bird said, no, Dr. Borham. He said, well, is there anything wrong with the berries in that garden? And the bird said, there's nothing wrong with the berries, Dr. Borham. He said, well, why don't you go down and have your breakfast? Why don't you get down in that garden and have your breakfast? But each bird pointed to something that was in the garden that prevented them from going and having their breakfast. And when Dr. Borham saw what the birds were pointing to, he said, you mean to tell me that you're allowing that thing to keep you out of the garden? That thing that's a stick thing that has a coat on it and straw coming out of the sleeves with a hat over it. You mean you're telling me that you're letting that which is not real that scarecrow keep you out of the garden? He said, let me tell you something, birds. He says, no farmer puts up a scarecrow in a garden except that there is something in the garden worth having. He said, so if I were you, I would fly looking for scarecrows. Because if there's a scarecrow in the garden, that means there's something there to benefit you. Can, can, can I ask you a question? Can, can I ask you a question? How many scarecrows has the devil put up in your life to keep you out of gardens? You should have been in a long time ago. What motivates you? Is it fear or is it faith? Imagination makes you successful. Motivation makes you successful. Here's something else. Aspirations. Seeing yourself. What you can be, what you can do. Aspiring to be something. One of the great challenges of segregated neighborhoods, according to Harvard sociologists, William Julius Wilson is what he calls social isolation. That when you're in poor neighborhoods, all you have around you is other poor people. And Dr. Wilson says that what a child becomes is based on what the child can see and based on what the child's mother can see. 
And that is why it's so important that we not keep and allow black people to be socially isolated in ghettos. Because you gotta see it. That's why church is so important. That's why the church is essential in the hood. Because it's in the church that I, I got to see some examples of aspiring people who could talk right, how to dress, what I could become. I can see it, aspirations, aspirations. And one of the great contributions that Jesus made to everyone he came in contact with was he allowed them to aspire. They, 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 they saw what they could be. No one had ever called, no one had ever called Simon Peter until Jesus called Simon Peter. You know what his name was. His name was Simon Johnson. <laughs> Simon Bar Jonah. Bar is the Hebrew word for son. So Simon, son of John, or if you reverse it, oh, come on now, Simon Johnson. And uh, his brother's name was Andy Johnson. And when Peter had sons, I guess they were called the Petersons, and when Andrew had sons, they were called the Andersons. You get it. What I'm trying to tell you is that he was just one of the Johnson boys around the corner. You know them Johnsons. They're good people, but they're not exceptional people. They're just ordinary people like the Cosbys and the Moors. But when Jesus saw Simon Johnson, he said from this point on, you shall become Peter, which means rock. And I'm sure everyone laughed when they called him rock. But Jesus helps you to aspire, and one of the keys to success is aspirations. Aspirations. I'm the president of a college. We lost everything, but I kept aspiring. We got our land back. We lost in 1930. The original buildings that we lost in 1930, we got them back after 77 years. We are the fastest growing college percentage-wise in the entire state of Kentucky, in HBCU. And that's because I aspired. We, 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 they said, don't now. And the other university said, no, don't do it. No, you're not going to mess with my aspiration. So we started developing our sports team and our basketball team. And last year we were featured on TBS in the middle of March Madness, Little Big College. Talked about our program because we got two NBA stars. The former coach of Howard University is one of our coaches. And we just a little big college, but aspiring big. And March, what, October the 30th, we will play the University of Louisville basketball team in the arena. Now we're going to get beat. But we're going to get paid. We're going to get paid. But lest I hold you too long, I hope you'll get it. I hope you'll get it. I mean it from, I mean it from my heart. Sometimes when preachers preach, and every preacher knows what I'm talking about, sometimes when we preach, we're talking to ourselves. We're talking to ourselves loud enough for you to hear. And I, I hope you'll get it. That success is imagination, motivation, watching out for it. The scarecrow, aspiration, and then one last thing, 
Success is liberation. I don't care how much aspiration you have. If you don't have some liberation, you will not be successful. If I were to ask you who the villain in the story is and who the hero in the story is, most of us would say that the villain in the story is the one talent man who hid his master's money because he was called lazy. He was called wicked. He had apparently no initiative. And that's because you've got the Fox News, <laughs> Donald Trump interpretation of the text. See, biblical interpretation is always autobiographical. We interpret the meaning of a text in light of our own social location. Those in positions of power and privilege see in a text or miss in a text anything in the text that threatens their power and privilege. So, for example, who is the villain in the story of the three little pigs? You would say the wolf. That's because you're pig-centric. <laughs> you've, 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 you've heard the story from the perspective of the pig. But I went to the hall of justice. I went to the jail to see and talk to the wolf to get it from his lenses, from the perspective of the oppressed. And I asked the wolf what happened. He said, thank you for at least talking to me. He said, what happened was, was that I was the first wolf in an all pig neighborhood. And the pigs, had been taught in their books that wolves were predators, that dark people were predators. So these pigs had an implicit bias. He said, one day I was sick, couldn't stop sneezing, so I knocked on my pig neighbor's house to see if I could get some NyQuil. And when he saw it was me, he said, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. <laughs> and the wolf told me, I'm telling you, he told me, he said, he said, I had a cold. He said, I sneezed. And the house was so flimsy of straw that after I sneezed, the straw fell on the pig and killed him. And I thought to myself, now there's no need wasting all these chitlins and pig feet and ham hocks. So I ate him. That's what he told me. In other words, hermeneutics, how you interpret a text is based on your location. And unfortunately, because black people have not gone to our own seminaries and have read books by European and German scholars instead of James Cone, we interpret things through other folks' lenses. We're like, what, sheepdogs? A sheepdog is the ultimate contradiction. Other dogs come and say, hey dude, give us some of them sheep, we hungry. Yeah. And you know what that sheep dog says? He says, bah. <laughs> He's a dog. But he thinks like a sheep. And he has no solidarity with dogs. Because when he was a puppy, he went to sheep school. 
went to sheep church had a picture of a sheep Jesus hanging in his church saw pictures of sheep angels learned sheep history thought his hair was good because it looked like a sheep so he became so sheep became so oriented as a sheep that he was not a dog anymore and part of being converted is to be reconciled Esther you ain't her, you're, you're not Esther, girl. You're Hadassah. Maybe, girl, since you're passing, that you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. You see, my brothers and my sisters, when you read a text, You see it through somebody's lenses. Let me tell you who the villain is. It's going to mess your sermons up. The villain is the master. See, the mistake we have made is we have always thought that the master is representative of God. But it does not say that in the text. Jesus simply said the kingdom, the basile of theos, the kingdom of God is like this. You see, what you have here is wealth calcification. What you have here, you know it's not God because God's not an oppressor. God does not promote slavery and the exploitation of people. See, what happened was, you see, the the, the man said to his master, he said, I didn't do anything because I know you. You gather where you don't plant, that's slavery. You reap where you don't sow. And what? read the story. The master said this. Since you know that I'm like that, why didn't you take my money to the bank? And then he became like Trump. He said, for those who have much, they will get more. That's Trump's tax cuts. So he gave it to the upper echelon who already had enough. He didn't even give it to the man who had two talents. He calcified wealth at the top said to the, to the two men who were his slaves. You know who they are. One name was Clarence Thomas. One was Ben Carson. He said to them, he said to them, enter until the joy of your master. If I'm a slave, I don't want to enter the jo- your joy. I want to be free. But the one slave who said, you know what? Regardless of what you do to me, I'm not going to participate in my own oppression. I'm not going to participate. And he said, "You you might do something to me, but I'm not going to participate And the master got so upset, not only did he take his stuff, but he threw him into not just darkness, but he threw him into outer darkness. 
he, he did the same thing that they did to Nat Turner. When in Southampton, Virginia, he said, no, no, we're going to have a revolt. And they threw him into outer darkness. It's the same thing that was done to David Walker. When Paul Robeson stood up like a man. And they took that Rhodes Scholar. And threw Paul Robeson into the outer darkness. When W.E.B. Du Bois was talking about the wealth gap. They threw him into the outer darkness. When Mega Evers was trying to sign up blacks to vote. They shot him in the back. Threw him into the outer darkness. When my homeboy, Muhammad Ali, said them Big Kong never called me a nigga. They took his title and threw him to the outer darkness. When Martin Luther King stood up for 1,200 sanitation workers, they maligned him, threw him into the outer darkness. When Colin Kaepernick said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to participate. They took his, his position and they threw him into the outer darkness. And guess what? If you are a child of God, if you're going to be a prophet, if you're going to tell the truth, if you really take your religion seriously, there will be times that you will be thrown into the outer darkness. But I got good news for you. There's somebody who also got thrown into the outer darkness because my Bible tells me that somewhere between the sixth and the ninth hour it got dark so if you get thrown in the outer darkness that's what Jesus is that's where he is that's why when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego when everybody else was told, everybody bowed down at the sound of the national anthem. When the Babylonian Philharmonic Orchestra starts playing Stars and Stripes, everybody hit the dust. And everybody hit the dust. But when the dust cleared, three heads were still standing. And they were thrown into the outer darkness. But when the king looked into the furnace, he said, now wait a minute. He said, I put three in the furnace. He said, but I see four walking around. And one of them looks like the son of God. And the king said, come out, Shadrach. Come out, Meshach. Come out, Abednego. And they all came out with the exception of the one who looks like the Son of God. Do you know why he didn't come out? Just in case you get thrown in. He's already there. Oh.